much about this. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, do we have any questions, uh, comments? I know how important uh, being part of the community is. Uh, with my son, I can see that, that he is not about just from school to home, but he needs to be involved in other community and other uh, things in the community. And uh, so it's not only play, it's like doing activities, going to the bank, just like uh, even of a share. And that's so important to convey to your legislators. So that's why it's so important that you go in and sign in pro of this, uh, of this bill so it can pass. I don't see any questions in the chat and I don't see any hands yes. raised. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Cheryl. I don't really do, I don't quite get the hand thing, but I raised my hand. So okay. my name is Thank Cheryl you. Munt and uh, I uh, work part-time. I have a disability, I'm a self-advocate, and I also uh, work part-time with people with disabilities. And, and my, uh, my title is Community Inclusion Specialist. Uh, we support people out in the community um, that are, that happen to have worked at the company that I'm that I work for, which is SCAC, and we all we work with retired people only at this point. Um, although at the end of the month, I go to a statewide group, uh, which is a CI committee meeting uh, that uh, I, Rod Duncan has been attending, and um, we are uh, talking about the job of community inclusion and defining it more so that we can. Uh, uh, make that pot and raise the pay and, and make it possible to really get the services out to people. Um, so I wanted to know, you know, if you had talked about that, I'm sorry I'd come a little bit late, and if that's included in the discussion today. I know that um, our bill focuses on allowing for both at the same time. There's a lot of um, talk about how we do that, yeah, how exactly that works with budget and the fiscal note and everything else. But I know that um, CEA also has a bill that Courtney will probably talk about that does um, improve the rates, for, does ask for rate improvement for community inclusion. So there's that piece as well. But Cheryl, I would, uh, and I we have a friend in common, so it's really neat to see you on this call. But she, I would invite you, uh, Cheryl, to participate in the day services work group with North Star because that's where those those really complex conversations are starting to happen. And I know I haven't seen you before. So if you want to email Adrienne, she put her name um, in the chat. She can get you information about how to join that. I would love to have you there. Thank you. Um, Brian, I see you have a question. Um, yes, uh, I was wondering, because I've been looking at this uh, on, on, on community integration versus like sheltered workshops, and I know there's a lot of concerns with sheltered workshops about isolating, uh, about the idea of segregation and substandard wage, and a whole bunch of other concerns. And I was wondering if North Star has like facts and figures I could look at as far as looking at community integration numbers and, you know, sheltered workshop numbers um, that I could, you know, peruse, so to speak, um, like the number of people that are, are being currently put into community integration type situations versus sheltered workshop situations. Yeah, we did share some of that information again in the North Star Day Services group. So I know we have some of that. Um, it's very small, the sheltered workshop or group supported employment, um, very, very small amount versus individualized employment. But um, we can you can email Adrian and she can um, see what we have to provide to you with that. But I know that we did bring bring some of that information forward that we got directly from DDA. Sandy, I just want to say there are no sheltered workshops for individuals with developmental disabilities in Washington. But Brian, really good question. We can talk a little bit more in detail on kind of your concerns and see if we can help um, educate on some of the nuances that we've had in this community recently. That so, would be that would be wonderful. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, the group supported employment is really the only kind of group employment that we have, right, Courtney? And it's very small. Okay, uh, we have one more question. And also, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. 
And so this is Carrie. Do you have a question? Just a quick question uh, related to sheltered workshops. My understanding is there are some private sheltered workshops. Is that correct? Does anybody know? I, I guess when I think about that, I think always of creating alliances, not sure if they would be good folks to co collaborate with, but or would they would be, you know, it's worth investigating. But I, I that's all I know is that I've heard there are some private ones. Does anybody know about this or would like to comment? It's not funded by state resources, um, and we can talk a little more too in regards to that. Okay, yeah. thank you, thank you. Hi, Anthony, do you have a question? Thank no, you. I was just going to comment Courtney. and say that, yeah, in my community, there we do have like one, I think still called Columbia Industries. It's like a private one, community-based sheltered workshop and stuff, and they still, even though they don't get the state thing, they still try to keep it open with community funds and stuff. Thank because you, they, Yeah, they yeah, really that's, think that's in that no one, that some of us can't work in that community. That's great to know. Thank you, Anthony. <clears throat> great information. Yeah, this a uh, so important to have these services to be part of uh, state services. Um, with that, if you have any other questions, please put them in the chat so we can keep moving on our uh, and, and our agenda. Right now, uh, we're going to move to actually Courtney and Karen Williams. Uh, they're going to be talking about the priorities for Community Employment Alliance. And go ahead. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to be here with uh, community members and, of course, Karen Williams, who is our, the CEA Legislative Co-Chair. I am the Executive Director of the Community Employment Alliance, and so we're going to talk to you about our priorities this year thus far, although most of you know, because I wanted to start by thanking you all, we had over 360 individuals sign in pro of Senate Bill 5790 last week, and that was just an incredible alliance alliance of why we need to support a sustainable rate increase and statewide school to work. And so um, as Karen and I introduced the priorities, we're going to be really quick because we have four individuals for each part of our Senate bill um, to talk about the importance and the relevancy. And then we're going to get to questions after. So save your questions or you can type them in your chat box. If you can't uh, type for whatever reason, we'll make sure to call on you in the end. We just want to make sure we're accommodating and getting to everyone who gets to share a wonderful story about why uh, Senate Bill 5790 is something we need to see happen. So for the first part, it's a two-fold bill. So there's two parts of the Senate bill. Uh, Senate Bill 5790 promotes an increased employment service provider rate increase for individual supported employment, group supported employment, and community inclusion based on a CPA or CPI, so a uh, consumer price index. Uh, the service uh, rates paid to employment service providers bears direct impact on the quality and quantity of service supports provided directly to citizens with intellectual disabilities. In this realm, the ability of people with disabilities to obtain and retain jobs in their communities. Jobs help citizens with disabilities live inclusive and contributory lives. Due to the lack of a rate increase, providers run the risk of no longer being able to provide quality services and supports for individuals with disabilities. So that's our first portion of the bill. Karen, do you want to talk a little bit about transition? Yeah, hi everyone. Great to see so many of your faces um, from across the state. So the other piece is about expanding transition. And what this means is that all students with intellectual and developmental disabilities leaving school are connected to adult services, including employment. So right now, only half of Washington students with intellectual and dis developmental disabilities are connecting to services after school, only half, and we need to do better. So we have these models across the state, and many of you have heard of School to Work, and these models show us that when we're collaborating to help students and their families through this big life transition, we can get to 71% of students employed one year after school. 
So we need to make this best practice accessible to students across the state and make a model that works in different types of community, rural or more urban, um, making sure that everyone has access regardless of where you're growing up and exiting school. So this bill would set up the expectation that schools and DVR and counties and DDA are working together to make sure students are graduating to engaged community activities. I put the link of our bill summary in the chat box and we're gonna to get to our uh, amazing panel today to talk about rates and then we'll transition to transition folks that are gonna talk about the need for this bill to pass in regards to school to work. So for first, I'm gonna have everyone introduce themselves just in case that I uh, may mispronounce their name, but I'll read their first name. So Dawn, you are a, uh, you are up to talk about uh, being an, a parent of a self-advocate. You're muted, Dawn. Okay, can you hear me now? Um, my name is Don and um, I, my son is 27 years old and they have uh, on, on the aut autism spectrum. Um, he, he's not able to self-advocate for him, uh, for himself. So I, I am um, advocating on behalf of my son and uh, his name's Victor and he is 27 years old and he has normal intelligence. However, he is severely language and socially impaired. So he's not capable of finding job on his own. He needs employment service such as SCAP to find a job for him. Despite of the language and social impairment, he enjoys <coughs> having people around Without a job, he would be completely socially isolated. And being socially isolated, he become agitated and engage in more self-symmetry behaviors. And he would get aggressive toward my husband and me. Um, he was once pushed my husband down to the floor and caused his back injuries. So, um, my son's case is not unusual for people on autism spectrum. So despite the great US economy with a record low unemployment rate of 3.9%. However, people on the autism spectrum, the unemployment rates are somewhere between 65 to 85% and based on multiple different sources. So most of the people on the spectrum, on the autism spectrum, a lack of ability to seek jobs on their own. They need employment services to find a job. Um, for my son, when the environment is calm and supportive and he has a good charisma, he has great work ethics, is very productive. In fact, he is more productive than his neurotypical peers. Even Amazon's HR recognized that Victor is a hard worker. However, due to the um, limited language comprehension, his coworkers, when his coworkers, supervisors approach him to give instruction to do things differently or change tasks, he be quickly become agitated and often the anxiety strikes him. He will quickly engage in the self stimulatory behavior such as very fast hand flapping, hand shaking and running back and forth and jumping up and down and causing a safety issues at work setting. And, and often he also become aggressive toward people such as he would like push people or abruptly nudge them. He has been working at Amazon warehouse uh, since October 2017, thanks for SCAC, a continuous um, employment support service. Um, during, during this, like almost like five, four and a half years time span, he had at least three close calls of being expelled from work due to his behavior issues. And he needs employment specialists to provide continuous support to maintain his job. 
actually Amazon requires his job coach from SCAC to be on site to support him, to avoid him being let go of his job. He loved his job. He enjoyed uh, working at Amazon's warehouse. Um, being able to work regularly in the inclusive environment, um, his, his in-home behavior is much more manageable. So as long as his aggressive behavior under control, my husband and I can continue um, support him. And so Victor will not become a society's burden, which we all know costs tremendous <clears throat> amount of taxpayers' dollars. Um, people on the autism spectrum do not do well with the constant changes. They like routines. So disruptive self-similarity behavior will occur with the frequent job, change, job coach changes. So it's crucial to pay the competitive wages in order to retain the employment specialist. Competitive pay help reduce and prevent staff turnover for employment service. So that's, <clears throat> so please support Senate Bill 5790. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Don, for your time. Really well said. Next, I would like to go to Mayor Ralph. And just a reminder to our speakers, there are interpreters. So let's be very slow and on point so that they can capture the accuracy of your, your testimony. Mayor Ralph. All right, good morning. Thank you so much. Um, I am here today to talk about the importance of supported employment um, for our community, for our employers, and most importantly, for our employees. I um, want to start with a huge thank you to our amazing partners here in, Kent, in Kent, Debbie Myers and SCAC um, for, for being there for our employers and being there for our employees. Um, I had the, the absolute honor of being able to um, provide a job to a supported employee in my prior career um, as a small business owner and Debbie encouraged me along the way and she's like, I know you can find something that's going to be suitable and I will tell you, um, we, we hired an employee, her name was Nancy and she brought so much rich richness to our very small office, we were just three people, but Nancy would come in with a giant smile on her face and share, share her stories and bring, um, bring just a, an amazing presence to, to our work environment. Um, when I became mayor of the city of Kent, I had committed to SCAC and all of our residents that we would look at a supported employment program here for the city of Kent. And um, I'm going to admit COVID has put a little bit of um, bind on that, but we're still we're still working forward. And I think it's important to talk about a couple of, of things about why, why I'm so committed to supported employment and I want to encourage all of our employers to be. Um, we talk, equity is a really important conversation that we're having in all of our communities. And um, oftentimes it, it leaves out a whole, a whole portion of our population, and that is our employees and our residents um, with disabilities. We, we talk about equity in, other, in every other realm, but when we say the word inclusion, it means we need to include everyone. And that means providing employment opportunities for everyone. Um, and um, here at the city of Kent, we have been able to expand those opportunities. Um, we, we were able to transition a, a longtime volunteer. AJ was a volunteer for, and Debbie can correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, but like 15 years. And it was one of my goals to make sure that he was rewarded for all of his commitment, just like any other employee would be. So we made him an employee and, and it just, it, to me, that's the importance of that message. And, and as a city government walking, um, walking the talk and doing the right thing. Um, it's important for the employee so that they can be, uh, have that fulfillment of being a productive part of something, of being a part of um, something bigger than themselves. But as we heard from the previous speaker, it's also important for the families because it does provide an opportunity, a little window of respite and provide for, um, you know, easier and better engagement at home when, when people are productive and feel like they're a part of something, it impacts their entire life. Um, and then the selfish side of all of this is really what the employer gains, right? It's, again, it's that, um, that ability to, to be inclusive. I will tell you, 
I'm again going back to, to AJ working at our permit counter. When folks would come in um, and see AJ do their working, completely changed their demeanor, completely changed their approach, because it's just, it's that reminder, right, that everybody has something and everybody can contribute something. And people just, I, I, it's hard to, it's hard to put into words the impact that it had both on our customers and our employees. So um, again, from the employer perspective, both as a private employer and as a city government, um, I'm a huge fan of supported employment for, for all of those reasons and really just would encourage everyone to take the time to make the consideration because the rewards and the benefits are great on, on all sides and for everyone involved. So um, thank you for the opportunity today to share that story. Thank you so much, Mayor Ralph. I appreciate you sharing and we do as well. Uh, next, we have Leona and I just want to make a correction. She's the Director of Community Services at Skillskin. My apologies, uh, but no shame in being a job coach. So Leona, you're next. Good morning and thank you for allowing me to participate. Uh, so as you've heard before, a job is much more than a paycheck. Working connects us to our community. It allows us to interact with others and provide wages that afford the necessities such as food and a roof over our heads. In the last 24 years, I've seen many changes in policy, perception, and most importantly, the level of inclusion. I've enjoyed working in various capacities while at Skillskin, always been empowering people through growth, education, and employment. My current role as the director community programs allows me to oversee all of our job developers and skills trainers. While working in this capacity for the last three years, I've witnessed several trends such as uh, problems with retention. Uh, we attract and hire good talent who are looking to make a change for good in our community but cannot stay due to the low wages. At our current funding levels, we cannot stay competitive with similar jobs, sales, case management, and social work. Our jobs are often a gateway into entry level uh, positions very, in various jobs within the social services industry. However, to be successful, employees need to be emotionally in progress. Progress. In progress. thinking on their feet and, and be solution oriented. These skills are not necessarily in an entry at level applicant. The employees we do retain are on the verge of burnout and due to the excessive caseloads they have. Our team believes in our clients and they serve and work diligently to help attain their employment goals. However, you have to put on your own oxygen mask first. There are people in our department who are no longer accruing vacation due to the fact that they have banked too much. I am one of those people. In order to allow my staff to take days off, I willingly go in the field to support them in taking a break. Um, I, I know I'm not alone. Many CEOs and executive directors are out in the field to continue to provide supports to their clients when staff are unable to do so. Our clients are no different from any other business relationship. They take time to foster and build. We're asking for a high level of trust from our clients and their families or staff. When we have turnover, we take multiple steps back, back in their employment journey. Uh, we lose much time rebuilding relationships and trust that sets our clients back substantially in their job search process. Losing employees means training new staff. This is costly in both time and money to bring a new team member up to speed. We have reviewed our training process to streamline them and make them effective as effective as possible while getting new employees comfortable with the required job tasks. Uh, the power of employment, uh, being part of something more important to us all. We all, we have all heard saying no man is an island, and this could not be more true or applicable, applicable to persons with disabilities. For the majority of their lives, this population has been segregated, made to feel different or less than, and told that they can't do. Through integration as a team member, there is an inherent sense of belonging. There is pride in a job well done and having a paycheck that allows you to purchase items you want instead of things you need. Where do you meet these people to make, to make these relationships? Work. Our clients deserve the same opportunities to be involved, a part of their community and the ability to grow. 
Um, transition is another area of struggle. Most individuals with disabilities are told at an early age about what they can't do. Then at the age of 21, they're out of school and they are expected to work. As part of that process, we're sharing what they can do. What kind of mis mixed message is that? Parents, families, and guardians are nervous about letting their loved ones venture out into the community where everything is out of their control. By working with students earlier and helping them understand what is available to them, we will have even more people available for our ever shrinking workforce. In summary, I would like to close with a story that demonstrates almost all the points that I have spoken about. Last week, I spoke to a tired and frustrated parent. She is a retired hospice nurse with two sons at home. They've been receiving employment services from our agency for many years. And due to the pandemic, they've been unemployed for some time and are eager to get back to work. Last week, both clients ended up with interviews and we were short staffed. So the mother was adamant that the interviews occur so they would, wouldn't stay in the basement playing video games. She in turn acted as their job coach by assisting them in the interview and educating the employer as well. The mother is exhausted but will not stop advocating for her children and her belief in the power of employment. This issue is bigger than dollars and cents. This issue is about quality of life that people deserve, especially people who want to work. Please support the proposed increased reimbursement will provide more people to attain freedom, equity, and most of all, pride. Thank you. Thank you, Leona. Next we have Julie Clark. And uh, I just want to remind everybody we are way far in our in our uh, agenda. So we want to have everybody the opportunity to come and share about the different uh, things we're advocating for. So please uh, be brief in your when you're sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, there are some questions in the chat. My name is uh, Julie Clark, and I use a Toby Diner Box, a speech device, to share my speech. I am 54 years old. Cerebral palsy is my disability. I have worked with an employment consultant from Morningside Services for 21 years. For 17 years, I held the secretary of position for the Division of Equal Access and Opportunity. I made valuable contributions during my time working there, and it was an essential part of my life. Since then, I have become strongly involved in advocacy for individuals with disabilities, and I am ready to utilize my skills and experience in a paid position. Now I am receiving support to assist me in pursuing my true passion and career in the realm of being a professional self-advocate and speaker for equality. A job coach has always been very vital to my work. I could not do my previous job without a job coach. She would be my hands for anything I needed physical support with. One of my biggest jobs was managing a database of employees who left the Department of Social and Health Services. My job coach would set me up for work by putting sheets of data into my notebook so I could put them into the database. She would organize my cubicle. If I needed technology help with my Dynabox, my job coach would make that call with me. My job coach would help me with communication with my supervisor. I feel confident about my future job, knowing that my job coach will be there for anything I need. I have a strong need and desire to contribute to the community. I feel accomplished and alive when I help other people, and it is rewarding for me to use my gifts for a purpose. When working, I feel like an example to others to go beyond what you think your limitations are. Working gives me a stable income where I can live comfortably. Work and career pursuits are more than a paycheck. They give people the ability to realize their full potential and passion. I feel very passionate about disability rights because I want to give back and I want people to get what they deserve so they can lead healthy and fulfilled lives too. People, including me, deserve to have high quality support from highly trained individuals and possess the appropriate skills to serve people with disabilities. 
These services are vital to individuals, and the people who provide these services deserve to be compensated fairly for their work. Uh, um, yeah. Thank you, Julie. That was awesome. Yeah. So we're going to pivot now to people who are going to speak about um, the transition expansion. And um, again, put your questions in the chat. And if you uh, prefer a verbal, we will have some time at the end for those. So I'm going to invite Dr. Tanya May from OSPI to come up first. Thanks, Karen. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. These are these are tough to follow. I'm so inspired by uh, what everyone's sharing today. So if you haven't met me before, my name is Tanya May, and I'm the Executive Director of Special Education at the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. That's a lot of words. Uh, but I work for the state for education, um, and I can share some news. President Biden has nominated my supervisor to go work at the national level and to support um, special education and students with disabilities across the country. And so if she makes that move, uh, my update is that I will step in as assistant superintendent of special education here for Washington. So I'm, as ever, um, so excited to be part of this community and to work with all of you. I wanted to, to talk a little bit today about transition and inclusion, uh, and my dogs have something to say about that too. Um, transition is lifelong, right? It doesn't start when a student turns 16 or starts to think about the next step after high school. It doesn't end when a student leaves the school system. And so to think about transition and inclusion uh, as, as activities for all of life, um, I, I just wanna say and appreciate the group that's with us today. I think our state agencies learn a lot from all of you. Um, the local partnerships that you've built, the transition networks that you're part of and the community groups have shown us that when partners work together around employment, uh, and transition supports, that improves the outcomes for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so I have an opportunity to be part of the transition collaborative. It brings all of our agencies together uh, to think about transition um, and to help students plan their next steps. And we really work closely with schools, with uh, employment and service providers, and also with our county partners. And what, we, what we've learned from all of you is, is just this reminder that all students across our whole state need access to employment supports, like school to work um, or, or other types of, of employment supports, regardless of where they live. That part of equity needs to make sure that those services are available everywhere. And so I'm very excited about uh, Senate Bill 5790, which brings all of this together and would help set up a statewide transition council, local interagency networks across the whole state, and employment and navigation supports statewide for students with, uh, with intellectual and developmental disabilities and to support their families. And I just wanna thank all of you. Um, the outpouring of support for, for Senate Bill 5790 was amazing. Uh, people showed up and they were ready to support this. Uh, it, was, it was just great to be part of. So this transition, right? As students are moving from school into their adult lives, that's something every student experiences. And I'm just um, so grateful to be part of this work to make sure that that transition process is positive for each and every student. So thank you all uh, for everything you do every day. Thank you, Dr. May. We're so lucky um, to have a future looking special ed director who knows that everything we do in school is growing us up to be adults that can belong and contribute. So thank you for your leadership. Amy Dahlberg, another school perspective, please take it away. Hi, 
So my name is Amy Delberg, and currently I am the director here of Olympic Academy. But my um, previous job here uh, before was special education teacher. And I had done all the way from life skills and um, EBD and, and, and in different schools. So um, here I was nervous about not taking up five minutes and now I'm nervous about going over five minutes. So please stop me because I'm in writing notes as people are talking and excited and going, yay, yay, yay. Um, but I guess my story and the excitement for this is, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of make a little comment here that I wrote down with the House Bill um, um, 19, 1980, and they talk about that both community and work. What it makes me think of is how in schools we talk about, we teach the whole child. When, the ch when a child comes in, we teach, you know, their emotional support, their academic support and all those other things. So it's like, this makes sense then to go from that to then in, in the community and work to where there are, they're learning how to play, they're learning to have fun, they're learning to, what, it, what does it mean to socialize? What does it mean to socialize as an adult? That looks a little different than socializing in school. So that is so important and exciting. And I'm gonna say as me, as a director, and supervising my staff, I tell my staff, it is important for you to go home and be family. It is important for you to do self-care. And I talk to my staff about self-care. What are you doing to have fun? Are you hiking? Are you playing? Are you going bowling? When are you shutting off from work? Because that's important. So, you know, with that, with that teaching, it's, it'd be, you know, it's, it's the same. And I just, that excites me. And that needs, that needs to happen with that bill. Um, the other thing that the uh, Senate Bill 5790, a lot of my notes there, um, which is exciting for me to, to expand that and have more providers for, I'm going back to the first time that I was a life skills teacher and didn't know a lot. I'm going to let you know, because in my personal life, I didn't know a lot about DB, um, the DBA or DBR services. So when I got into that job and I started learning about that, it would be so beneficial if I could have had, you know, uh, access or knowing that I had access to somebody who had some time to explain to me, um, Amy, these are the papers that are going to come to you from, from DBR services or DDA services. And this is how you fill it out. This is how you can help support the family to fill it out um, correctly so they can get these services. Um, in the rural areas, we don't, you know, there's um, the special ed teachers doesn't have as big as group as some of the bigger districts. So in those rural areas, having that support of a DDA or DBR person to be able to explain to these teachers how to fill it out to support those parents and also ease the parents um, mind to let them know, hey, I'm filling it out, you know, the best I can. And then how, how can I support you? Um, also, my next little thought as I was writing this down, when Don was talking about, um, and I, I apologize, Don, I don't remember your son's name, but when she was talking about him um, working and and having and having to support, I think letting letting life skills teachers know, okay, when they go out in the community, this is what they're going to need to learn. This is what they're going to need to do. They're going to need to learn transitions. So then how can I help my community? So if I go out in my community and I'm saying, I'm going to a job, I would like to be able to teach the, the workers. I'd like to be able to teach the employers there. Hey, let me teach you some skills of what you're, you know, of what you need when these kids come. So that way they can employ, you know, more people. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of all over the place because this is just very exciting. These, um, these two things are exciting and, and it's just, um, I'm glad to be here and be a part of it. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate your perspective and your own experiences. Very helpful. It does take the village, right? So Christine Nelson, you're up and then Lucas. Great. Good morning. Hi. I'm one of the school psychologists uh, and the first ever uh, transition coordinator with the Bonnie Lake, uh, Sumner Bonnie Lake School District. And I really thank you guys for letting me talk about how important the school to work program is. Uh, 
first of all, I want to start with, with a success story of a 2018 Sumner uh, Bonnie Lake District student who, uh, during the graduation ceremonies for our community-based transition program, had to hurry off and interview for his first job at Mod Pizza in Bonnie Lake. And he was uh, interviewed and actually got hired for that job because of the school to work program that is now available in Pierce County. It's a robust training program that's available to students who of course are eligible for DDA services and who live and go to school in Pierce County. So stepping back a bit, I moved here to Washington State as a newly minted school psychologist with also a second uh, master's degree in vocational rehabilitation counseling and transition services from Kent State University in Ohio. That was in 1997. And I naively actually expected a similar kind of coordination that we had in Ohio between state DVR services and the, the school services to allow for that coordination between school and adult support in the community. Well, that really didn't exist here at the time. And during an early 2000s uh, transition network group that I was participating with uh, in the Puget Sound ESD, I heard a speaker talk about these wonderful programs happening within the school districts in Auburn and Kent and Seattle and Tukwila um, in King County, and it was called School to Work Program. And I remember being around the table, getting really excited, thinking, this is, this is what I've been missing. This is how we can help our students in Sumner and Bonnie Lake connect the dots to help get ready for when school is over. And I raised my hand and I was like, how do I, how do I, I want this in our school too. And I remember hearing a chuckle, sort of supportive, but I heard other folks, you know, saying, well, that's King County. You don't, your school isn't in King County. You don't have that. And I was so taken aback because these are the exact services that my students needed too. And my families needed as well. And, you know, King County was just right there and we in Pierce County, <laughs> I, like I can see it from, <laughs> from our house. Anyway, later on, of course, we were able to develop the Pierce County School to Work program. And I strongly support the House Bill 5790, which would allow School to Work services to be coordinated throughout the state. It shouldn't matter where you live in Washington state to uh, have these services provided to students and families. So in conclusion, you know, for counties without the school to work program, uh, which is really only currently operating, I believe in seven counties in our state, the big question really is what happens to these young adults when the school bus stops coming? You know, school and it's 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. five day a week schedule with built in therapies, medication management, adult supervision, IEP coordination, classroom routines and activities. That actually really is a very short term time that that kind of daily environment that these young adults and their families have gotten quite used to for 20 years. And then when the school bus stops at 7 a.m. that doesn't come anymore. How do we help best prepare families. And that's within a school to work kind of program that integrates what adult services look like into the school setting. So we can help communicate how do you access these services that are so much different than what the IEP services team looks like. So in conclusion, thanks again for letting me speak um, and highlight this young man who got that job at Mod Pizza during that graduation ceremony. And that really was in, in large part because of the services provided by the School to Work program in Pierce County and every county, every student with a developmental disability and their families deserve that kind of program. So I'm in full support and please um, encourage others to support Senate Bill 5790. Thank you. Thanks so much, Christine. I love that story. I'm sure a lot of us um, were kind of rooting for that outcome of that interview. And yes, there are Christine teachers all over the state that are saying, what do I do with my student next? And we have this adult service model that is there. We just need to connect them, right? So thanks for your leadership. Okay, we're going to wrap up with a great story. Lucas, do you want to um, take it away here? Um, yes. You ready? We are ready for you. 
Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to come and speak today and share my story. My name is Lucas Edsor. I live and work on Whidbey Island in Allen County, Washington. I attended Cooper High School and the Okaba Transition Program and graduated in 2018. I started working at Pickles Deli as a dishwasher in 2017. During my last year of school, my job coaches worked with me, worked with my boss, Kim, to set up a job that works well for me. Pickles Deli has been a good first job for me. I enjoy making money and getting my paycheck. I like to spend my money and outings with Johnny, taking a favor and eating lunch. I also spend my work money traveling to see my family in other states. Having a job also allowed me to move into my own apartment about two years ago. Now I use my paycheck to help pay for my rent, food, and living expenses. I love living on my own and watching movies in my own place. <clears throat> I like working because I like to be part of the team. I like to help the customers at Pickles, and I like to help my boss, Kim. Working at Pickles Daily also helped me land my dream job later this month. I'll be starting a new job as a page at Snow Island Lobby in Freeland. I have been a volunteer there for years. Should help me get my new job at the library. I'm the first of what will hopefully be money supported and employment pages with the Snow Island system as they prepare the new program for hiring workers like me. I'm excited to start working at the library because I'm a movie lover. Uh, because I love the employees at the Food and Library. I have been going there for years and I love to be there. Now that I've reached that goal, I'm thinking about adding another dream job to work at Toby's Tavern near my apartment in Coopville. I'm thankful that I was able to start working and earning money before I graduated. I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to get their first job on the dream job. Thank you. Excellent. Congrats on your new job, Lucas. That's Thank awesome. You. Very cool. All right, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Ivanova again. Thank you for all our speakers who shared your story. Thank you so much. Before she shares, I just wanna ask if we have any questions, could you please uh, put them in the chat? And uh, thank you so much for talking about such an important issue for our community and, uh, and to bring that support in the legislature to have passed this. Thank you so much for your presentation and everybody that shares such important support that you are doing. Thank you. And with that, we go to Ivanova with a proclamation. Go ahead, Ivanova. Hello, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today and thank you for our excellent speakers. I will now get, will read the governor's proclamation uh, for employment all day. The, United, the state of Washington, uh, whereas the state of Washington has a long history of leadership in practicing and promoting equal opportunity for people who have disabilities. Whereas individuals with disabilities continue to experience unemployment and poverty at rates substantially higher than those without disabilities. Whereas Washington's Employment First Law recognizes that all individuals, regardless of their disability, will be afforded an opportunity to pursue integrated competitive employment. And Whereas Washington is recognized nationally for its excellence and success in providing supportive employment services to people with disabilities across and whereas employees with disabilities require assistance to ensure job success and should have access to supports necessary to succeed in the workplace. Well, and now therefore I, Jay Inslee, governor of the state of Washington, therefore proclaim February 2nd, 
2022 as Employment All Day. In Washington, I encourage employee, employers to join me in fighting perceptions that are keeping people living with disabilities from joining the workforce, encouraging employers to hire people with disabilities as an integral part of the workplace workforce. Signed this 24th day of January 22nd, 2022, Governor Jay Inslee. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. On to Diane's status. Go ahead, I think, Diane. I think we have Sarah Stewart uh, first, and then we'll go to Diana. Sarah? That's, yes. Thank you, Courtney. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Hi. So I am a contract lobbyist and new contract lobbyist for um, CEA. And I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for all of your organization and all of your hard work. Um, I looked up a quote today and it was, this is one I really liked and it was JFK who said, one person can make a difference and every person should try. I get all emotional, sorry. I really care about bills and issues that are good for people who, you guys are doing the right thing. And so what I just really want to emphasize is when talking with legislators and talking with everybody, a lot of people don't know this exists and they don't understand the importance, you know, they see so many bills and so many issues. And, you know, I was, I've been enjoying just getting, being educated myself, you know, and I think that really talking about it on a very personal level with your stories is just so impactful and important. And, um, I'm happy to help with anybody needs anything or has any questions, but um, just really, you guys can really make a difference and they'll listen and the, you voted them in. These are your representatives and senators and um, they need to hear from you. So good job and please uh, reach out if ever anybody needs anything. And I'm really proud to be representing you. It's a really good group. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah. It's great to have you here. Is Seth in the meeting? No? Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. It is such an important issue and thank you so much for everyone to come and, um, and share. We have a few minutes. <laughs> We're like back on time. Thank you so much for uh, accepting the questions in the chat. Do we have any questions? Uh, right now, we can take about, let's say, three questions before we go to uh, Diana or comments. You're going to say, first you say all the questions in the chat, and now you want us to speak up. So <laughs> thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> I'll just acknowledge there were several comments in the chat box. And if anyone wants to vocalize them right now, that would be a good opportunity. Otherwise, we will definitely connect. I provided my email address. And thank you so much for everybody sharing your stories. So vital to hear the irrelevancy of both parts. We need both parts of this bill to pass because we can't have one without the other. We really need to be able to sustain here. That's right. Uh, the link is, or the links for the proclamation is on uh, social media. So if you go to Community Employment Alliance, so that's a hint to follow us, you will see our proclamation. And then I can also share with Diana, I believe I already did, but she can share it with everyone who attended today. Courtney, could you share the link on the chat? Sure. So people can find it easier. That will be great. Thank you. So I think with this, we go to Diana, to Diane. Go ahead for an update. Thank you, Gabriella. Um, I'm going to share my screen and um, talk about the bills of interest right now. And we've been working on a lot of stuff this session. And we keep it up to date on our website. Um, if you go to arcwa.org, um, A R C W A dot O R G, um, and then you hover over the advocacy tab and the bill tracker is the first thing on there now. And you can find the bills of interest and you can also every week we update what the hearings are that are happening 
for those bills. So if you want to attend a hearing, you can find out what day it is and what time by clicking on the hearings of interest. But for right now, we're going to go to the bills of interest. And we have a lot of bills going on right now. Um, one of the things that we track is the budgets on the bills because they actually have bill numbers. So we've got the operating budget as well as the capital budget. And right now where those stand is just that the governor has given his budget proposal um, and we wait until the week of the 20th of February is when the revenue forecast comes out for our state. And after that, the House and the Senate will each release their own budget proposals. And from there, we'll look at everything that they're proposing to fund for us. And we have many bills that need funding to go with them. So we'll be watching that and tracking it when those budgets come out and we'll be updating that on our website as well. But for right now, most of the focus is on the bills. And that is because um, I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom of this page so that you can see on the bottom here, it gives the cutoff dates. And that means bills have to make it through to a certain point by those dates. If they don't pass their committees by those dates, then the bill dies. Sometimes they can come back to life, but for the most part, most of the bills will die. And we have a, a cutoff coming up on Thursday, um, February 3rd is the first policy cutoff. So if bills haven't made it out of their policy committee, um, then the bills die. And then right after that, um, four days later, we have February 7th is the cutoff. If they need money, they have to go through the policy committee and then the money committee, either House Appropriations or House Finance or Senate Ways and Means. And so bills have to make it out of those committees by the 7th. And then from there, what we see is we watch on the House floor and the Senate floor, they will just be working until February 15th, trying to pass bills on the floor and get them moved over to the next step in the other house. So, We'll be watching those and letting you know this, this chart gets updated every Monday morning. So you can check and see where your bills are. Um, they, you know, we keep track of what committee they're in and um, whether they're up for a public hearing or whether they're up for exec session, you see, you'll see exec which means that it's moving out of that committee. And that's what we want to see is, you know, bills having passed through exec session um, and so that they can keep moving. And then they go into rules, the rules committee, where legislators can request to pull certain bills to the floor for a vote. So I'm going to just highlight a few of the bills. Um, we do have the adult family home bills. Adult family homes have been really kind of overlooked as a residential um, option for a while. And we really want to support those because they have been very helpful for a lot of people as far as having a residential setting. Uh, let's skip down here a bit. I want to go over the employment and day services bills that we're looking at. House Bill 1872 is a care worker center. And they that proposes to put together um, a care worker center that would support professionals, direct support professionals, professionals of all kinds that people meet with disabilities need access to. But those, those workers need support. They don't get near enough. And so Representative Sen wants to put together um, this group to provide that support for them. Um, she did mistakenly call it direct services professionals, 
but she's going to amend that on the floor to um, direct support professionals. Um, other than that, the bill is great. Uh, House Bill 1980, you've heard a lot today about the dual services that people, everybody normally has the option of working during the week and during the day, and then their evenings and their weekends, they can go relax, you know, blow off some steam from work or whatever they need to do. Um, but currently people with developmental disabilities don't get that option. They're told you can work for a few hours a week or you can go out in the community for a few hours a week. And that's, that's not something we wanna see. It didn't used to be that way. We used to be ha able to have both services, but there was a budget downturn and during that time, they took that away and, and made it to be an either or situation. So we wanted to go back to being both. Um, Senate Bill 5763 has to do with the subminimum wage certificates. Last year, self advocates worked really hard and got the bill passed to repeal those subminimum wage certificates so they couldn't give out any more. But there were still a few certificates which were good for a year um, that some employers had. So they had to wait till all of those expired. And so now they can actually repeal the statute in law and take that out completely so that no one can ever use the subminimum wage certificates again. And then Senate Bill 5790 is the other one that we've talked a lot to, about today. And that's increasing the employment and community inclusion rates, as well as establishing school to work in all counties instead of just a few. So we're watching all of those bills. So far, they're doing well. Um, Care Worker Center, House Bill 1872 is in appropriations. And so it has until the 7th to move. Uh, House Bill 1980, the dual services has already been exempt from its policy committee, which is good since um, tomorrow is the deadline to get out of them. Uh, Senate Bill 5763 has already made its way to Senate rules and Senate Bill 5790 is scheduled for, or was scheduled for exec session this week. It, it got exec on Monday. So um, you can go to our website to, we've got a lot of bills here, as you can see that we're tracking. And we also have some budget provisos down at the bottom that you'll see that legislators have requested funding for specific things. And Representative Dolan um, has requested funding for a, a one-year pilot for a school to work program that is statewide. Um, and there's a budget proviso from Senator Braun for increasing community engagement rates um, as well. So you can always look on our website for this and go through more. Um, it will get smaller. Uh, by next week, we will have had both of the cutoffs for the policy committees and the money committees. And so many of these bills will die during that process that don't make it past those cutoffs. And so we'll have um, a pretty updated one next Monday that shows where we're at. So you can always check this on our website, um, you know, on the bill tracker page. And then, you know, you can always check for advocacy days as well. We encourage you to attend them all. Um, we record them and put them online. And uh, you can always register for the ones that are still upcoming. And we just appreciate everyone who's been attending this today. We had 150 people on here, which was great. And um, make sure you give us feedback as well. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing here and turn it back over to Gabriella. Thank you so much, Diane, for your presentation. And uh, do we have uh, any questions? And as uh, you heard from Diane, please uh, submit your survey. Um, could you share the link? I'm looking for the 
you share the link in the chat. Oh, thank you. For Jessica the is going to, to hit that as well. Okay, thank you. And at this point, do we have any comments, any questions about um, employment, about activities after the employment? Uh, and I see Sarah has a question. Go ahead. Hello there. I raised my hand. I am here. I am the instructor for the attic class in Burlington, Washington. We are a transition program. And I just asked my students, I said, does anybody have, have a question? And they don't have any questions, but they would like to say hello. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera around so that everybody has a chance to say hello. So get, be, bear with me while I turn the laptop around. All right, guys, go ahead and say hello. Hello. Okay. Good to see all of you. Thank you so much for sh sharing your students with us, Sarah, and sharing this information with them. It's great to see you again. We, we look forward to when we can go back down to Olympia again. We have students that were able to share their stories about going down to Olympia. And, um, and doing all of this in person and uh, talking about the rain and the walking. And <laughs> but um, but we're, we're looking forward to being able to do it again. All right, thank you everyone. Thank, thank you so you much, so. Sarah. And we have Kyle and after that, we're gonna ask uh, Jessica to do a wrap up for us. Go ahead, um, Kyle. Just basically somebody asked a question but to cut off one more time. Um, if you don't get anything in by tomorrow at, at 5 p.m., if anything does not get done, it doesn't make it out. And then a few days later, just remind you that if that after does that, if it gets to the polish, it gets to the money committee and it does not get out of the money committee, that means it's pretty much gone deal until next year. I mean, I encourage you if you know that something is going to happen, say, hey, please pass this important bill or to or to say hey can we bring it up next year get it on their calendars for next year so that we can keep this pushing forward no so, thank you <laughs> thanks kyle and yes monday is the fiscal cutoff and tomorrow is the policy cutoff so if you have a bill that hasn't made it out yet contact the chair of the committee and ask them to move it forward Yes, it's so important. Thank you so much, Kyle, Diana. And uh, I don't see, uh, okay, so with that, we go to the wrap up. Ivanova, would you like to introduce the wrap up, uh, Jessica? I'd like to introduce Jessica, who is our Epic Sale admin, to do the wrap up. And take it away, Jessica. After this briefing, you have many options to advocate with your legislators. You can schedule a Zoom meeting with your legislators, email today's information to them, and watch or testify at a hearing. First, you can email your legislators about bills that are important to you and to set up appointments with them. You can also watch hearings on TVW at www.tvw.org. You can sign in to testify at future hearings. You can sign in pro, con, or other or submit written testimony on a bill. Let me show you how it works. Go to www.leg.wa.gov and scroll down to let your voice be heard. Click on participating in the process. Then click on testifying in a virtual hearing. Chose House or Senate, depending on which committee you want to testify at. We'll look at a house bill today. Select the house button. Then for this morning, let's look at housing. Human Services Committee. 
where many of our bills go to. Choose the date and time of the hearing. We'll pick this bill as an example. Then select the type of testimony you want to give. You can do live testimony virtually via Zoom. Just sign in with your position on the bill or submit written testimony. Today we will sign in to testify. Choose your position on the bill, pro, con or other. Fill out the form with your name, email, full address and phone number. If your name is hard to pronounce, you can sound it out in the pronunciation box. As an example, the pronunciation for Stacy Dime would be Da C Dim. If your name is easy to pronounce, don't worry about filling out that box. Usually you will be testifying as an individual. But if you are part of a panel, you would enter your name and info as a new panelist. Then add each person's info who will be on the panel after that. Finally select I am not a robot. After you submit the registration form, an email will be sent to you with Zoom link information. Once you get the email, it has links to add it to your Outlook, Google, or Yahoo Calendar. Advocacy Day is a project of the Ark of Washington State and funded by the Washington State Developmental Disabilities Council. Be sure to join us for future Advocacy Days. Register for each Advocacy Day on our website at www.arqua.org Advocacy Days. We want to make sure you are satisfied with Advocacy Days, so be sure to fill out our feedback form. Your feedback helps us to continue improving and helping your voice to be heard. Let's walk through it together. Start at www.arqua.org Advocacy Days. Scroll down to the smiley faces that say your feedback matters and select click here. The link to the feedback form in Spanish is right below the link to the English version. Start by putting in your email address. Next, you select the advocacy day you're giving input for. Then you respond if this is your first advocacy day or not. Next, next you pick the smiley faces that answer how you feel about the virtual advocacy day. Then you submit the form. Just as simple as that. Your input helps Diana and the ARC to know what you like, what you don't like, what is helpful, and what is not helpful. You can learn about these and more ideas to get involved on our website at www.arqua.org and click on Advocacy Days. You can also contact us at sale at arqua.org or diana at arqua.org if you need help. Are there any questions? Thank you, Jessica, so much for uh, sharing with us. Uh, Diane or Stacy, do you have the link for the evaluation so you can share in the link? Yes, I'll put, I'll put that in the chat. Thank you so much. And it and looks like Carrie Cunningham has a question for you. Yes, and also I see Carrie. So go ahead. Well, I don't know. Is there something going in the background? Oh, I just had a question about on our sheet about the bills. 
uh, it was Senate Bill, I think five nine, no five seven nine zero. There was a little we need we need money and housing, or I wasn't quite sure why that was in the column because none of the others had a comment like that. So I just I'm asking for an explanation. Okay, Diane, so this is yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is Diana, and um, there was a couple bills that we support the bills because they're very important but they are missing a little bit of something that we need the rhc bills the residential habilitation centers are our state dd institutions and we have wanted to close those for many years um, and we had just have had a hard time getting very far out of the six we had two have closed over the years but we still have four left and we have continually watched the number of people in, in them decline. There's only 500 people left in those four institutions now. Um, so the bill you're talking about would close the institutions. That's what it says to do. And it gives a timeline for them um, to be all completely shut down by 2028. And it's a great goal and we want it to be accomplished. But in order for us to move people out of the RHCs, we have to have residential placements for them. And that's a huge issue for the DD community right now. There are still over 60 people who are sitting in an RHC, in a state institution, who want out and they have the funding to get out, but there are no community placements available. So we need to increase the number of state operated living alternatives and increase uh, wages for supported living staff so that they can staff more residential placements. And so it's just a, a concern we have. We totally support the bill and what it wants to do, but because it hasn't really addressed the housing issue in there, that's why we put the note with it. Does that help? That's very helpful. Thank you, Diana. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. And uh, please uh, don't forget to fill up the survey form. And um, do we have any other burning question that somebody might have? No? I don't see any, any questions. And uh, they're asking for the link. Diana, could you share that? Thank you so much. There's a, the link in the chat for the survey. Please fill that up. And um, if we don't have uh, any other comment or question, I don't see anything. I'm trying to look through the pages. It's like I don't see any hand or anything. Okay, thank you so much for everybody coming on today, presenting and sharing such important issues. And um, your voice matters. Please reach out to your legislators and sign in pro or um, testify for uh, all these bills that are so important for our community throughout the state of Washington. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Ivanova, I don't see you. Where did you go if you want to say, Bye to everybody, and we see you here next week at the same time. And please register so you can get the link. Uh, Diana, any any other comment? No, just thank you to everyone who's attended because this is, you know, employment and day services. Having a full life is important to every single person, and we want to make sure that people with developmental disabilities are included in that and are able to have a full life as well. And so we thank all the speakers who came on today to talk about these issues and encourage people um, to, to get involved and to be supportive of the things that need to get happen in the legislature to make everyone have that opportunity of a full life. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and sorry for Hurrying up. Everybody's like, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Have a great rest well, of your You week. did a great job, Gabriella. We <laughs> had a lot of speakers today to manage, so you did great. Well, thank you.
Thank you for bearing with me. Have a great day and see you next week.